How you doing, Stefan? Good to see you, man. Keep walking, hero. All right, way to go. Well, I'm glad you braved the cold this morning. You can say hi to the people online because that's probably about 90% right there. Everybody back there sitting on their sofa. Kind of reminds you of the Chiefs game. Amen. You guys ready to worship? <laughs> Let's stand and worship together. God's house. 
Uh, sorry for just kind of jumping in here, but uh, we'll say hi to Ben. He was he's pretty sick today, so you're gonna make sure you wave hi to him because I'm sure he's watching right now, watching every mistake I make. So, sorry, Ben. <laughs> Amen. We'll pray for you later. A um, couple things, housekeeping rules. First of all, I'm actually surprised there's more of you that showed up today than I thought, so amen to that. That's pretty cool. Especially the first service people that are coming in, they're like, that doesn't sound like a hymn. So, sorry guys. Uh, if you've got offering, the, the baskets are along the walls over here, and if you've got your connection card, those can go in there as well. We'd like to keep up with you guys, so if you have prayer requests or praises, that's where those go. And also, hopefully, you picked up your communion. We're going to be doing that after the sermon today. Amen? So, let's take a moment to greet everyone that came and braved the cold.
is gone and mercy fills the streets to look upon the one who bled to save me and walk with him for all eternity. There will be a day when all will bow before special message that you have today, Lord, that it would just get through all the stuff that surrounds us, and Lord, that it would just get in there. We would feel it, and we would feel your presence. We love you, Lord. We want to serve you in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen. You may be seated.
I'm glad to see you all uh, made it in here this morning. I don't see too many uh, icicles hanging off of anybody this morning, so glad you guys could make it. Special welcome to everybody joining us online. Uh, I noticed before I came up here, we had a huge number of online this morning uh, watching us. Uh, when I left my house this morning, it was minus nine. don't know what time it was for you guys, but uh, I think that's about the coldest I've ever experienced in life. And uh, I was trying to make a Facebook Live video when I pulled in the parking lot. I was like, I'm going to make one as I walk in. And I totally underestimated my ability to talk in 25 mile an hour wind in minus nine conditions. Because as soon as I started to talk, it's like the, the breath just left me. <laughs> So I quickly stopped it and made one in my office where it was quite a bit warmer with a space heater. But uh, glad you all could make it. Glad you guys are here. Uh, special thank you and shout out to our welcome team that was sitting outside this morning. Yeah. Uh, I know Chris and Randy and Myron were out there. Was anybody else out there this morning helping with that? Uh, and I'm talking about the guys outside bundled up. Uh, Randy, I, I caught him before I, I came up here, and he was looking at his hair in the mirror. He had taken his hat off, and he goes, this is a good look. I said, being here is a good look. Bob's over there, too. Yeah, the leader wasn't out there. Bob, Bob is the leader of the welcome team. He wants you to know he was not out there. Um, <laughs> so uh, very, uh, very uh, sacrificial of Bob to make sure he was keeping the heat going. So that was good for the rest of us. Uh, but uh, thank you guys for being here. Uh, thanks to Tracy, he kind of hopped in here at last minute. We got a text from Ben yesterday afternoon that he was sick, wasn't going to be able to make it in. So uh, Tracy hopped in here with the band and, and uh, we're able to have some music this morning. Uh, but glad you guys are here. Curious, how many of you went to the Chiefs game last night? Nobody, or at least nobody's brave enough to admit that they went. If I actually went, you would not have heard the end of it. Uh, I had a ticket to the game to go, actually. I was given a ticket uh, last week to go with, with a friend of mine, and um, he texted me Thursday and said, sorry, they fell through. Their company tickets, and his business has the tickets, and he said, somebody claimed them, they wanted them, and I didn't try to talk him out of it. And uh, I said, well, just so you know, I've never been more bummed and also not bummed at all at the same time in my entire life. So we swapped setting out in minus five degrees for sitting in front of his fireplace watching it while eating pizza. I think we came out ahead in that deal, but uh, it was kind of fun to watch. Uh, I wonder how many of you did watch the game and you saw this during the game. Um, you know, Big Red, he's got his coat on, but I, I, I appreciate this. No hat, no face guard. And if you watch closely, they showed this a few times when it got really up close on him. Um, we had a debate if that's spit through condensation in his breath or snot. Um, all I know is if he would have sneezed, he might have killed somebody within five feet of him. So uh, we don't need to look at that anymore. But uh, yeah, it was fun uh, to watch from the heat of, of a living room. Uh, but uh, we're glad we're here this morning. Uh, glad you guys are here this morning, whether that's in person or online. Uh, we're in week two of this series we started last week called A Call to Cruciformity. And uh, we uh, are, are going through the book of Philippians, eight weeks through this book. And uh, last week, we kind of just j uh, jumped right into the first half of chapter number one. And, and Paul kind of gives an overview for where he's going to go. We, we talked about how this letter is going to have a lot of talk about joy in it. That, that, that's a theme that repeats itself throughout. But as we looked at this, we kind of saw where Paul wants to go. And as we get ready to dive into the second half of chapter one today, I've got a question for you. What do you live for? Like if I were just to ask you this, if you were taking notes and you were writing something down, what do you live for? Maybe it's family. It's, it's your kids. It's your, 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 your parents, siblings, whatever family you have that you call family, friends could, could roll into this. What do you live for? Maybe it's what you do, your, your career, your hobbies, kind of maybe that's all one and the same. That's a passion for you. You can immerse yourself in it. Maybe it's something like sports or something that, that is kind of outside of yourself, but it's still something you live for. What would be your answer to this particular question here? I think there are so many different things that we can, can answer this with, and I don't know if some of those answers are right or wrong. It's, it's just for you to decide what it is that you want to live for. As we get into the, the second part of chapter 1 of Philippians, Paul really lays out for us what it is that he lives for. Uh, kind of like we did last week, I'm just going to read through. There's a couple of long sections here today. I'm going to read through them, and then we're just going to dive bomb a couple of topics. Not necessarily hit on every word of every line, but kind of see where he's wanting to go here. In chapter 1 of Philippians, starting in verse 12, here's what Paul says. I want you to know, my brothers... 
that what has happened to me has really happened to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely thinking to afflict me in my, or not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Paul is kind of going to lay something out here that I think we need to understand. And you kind of maybe saw the little bit of repetition there. That when it comes to joy, Paul states this. True joy is found when you share the word or preach the word or share the gospel. You can phrase that a variety of different ways here. Again, step back and remember what we said last week. Think about the context. Where is Paul in this moment here? He's in prison. And he's telling you to go preach the word. Now, a lot of times you think, well, you know, I'd love to preach the word, but I don't have a Bible college degree. I don't know how to craft a lesson. I'm not articulate. I'm, I'm not all of these things. And you need to know that's, that's okay. That's okay. It's not about how, you know, smooth of a talker or polished you might be. It's not about how knowledgeable you are. It's about how much you care and willing you are to spread the word in the name of Jesus. Again, Paul is in chains here. When we say he's in prison, it's not like he's just sitting in a jail cell like you might imagine or picture on TV. No, he is chained up to another person, to a wall. And as he's talking about this, when you read through what he says there, it's important to notice what he doesn't say. He's not asking for sympathy or anger here. He himself is not angry here. He's not trying to get people to rally and cause a riot and can break him out of prison. He's also not trying to get people to find a way to help him get released. On the contrary, he is simply focusing his joy on the fact that so many people are preaching the gospel. That's where his mind goes. That's where his focus is. And he has been trying to reach and inspire those as well, too. It says that, that the prison guards even know about Jesus because of him. The prison guards know about that. And because the prison guards are knowing about this and spreading it, all of these people who are Christians who might have otherwise been fearful because Paul was put in chains now are bold. They've got courage because they see what's happening when Paul is spreading this word. But at the end of this, he mentions two types of people who are preaching the word of God. He says there are some who are preaching to make themselves look good, and some who are preaching because they sincerely have it in their heart to spread the gospel. Maybe you know people like either one of those. You've been around preachers or pastors who you think, this guy is just trying to make himself look good. This one is really sincerely deep from the heart. I don't really want to know which one of those you think I am, okay? Uh, you can just keep that to yourself. That's fine. You know it's the one from the heart, so that's good, okay? I, that's, that's where we're at, right? No, I'm kidding, but you, you do know people like that. And Paul is saying here, you know what? Whatever you're thinking, it's easy to look at the other one that you don't agree with and say this person's doing it wrong. Paul's saying, I don't care. They're preaching Jesus. That's what matters. They're getting his name out there. That's what matters, and that's what's bringing him joy in a situation in life where it's going to be hard to find joy. I think for us, we can capture that same spirit, that same joyful tone in, in, in our lives, that same joyful mindset in our lives. And I think we see here from Paul two steps for us to get to that. You want to spread that same kind of joy. Here's the first step. Learn to say no to yourself. Say no to self. Yeah, It may sound kind of hard to do. Or on the contrary, you may think it sounds really easy to do, but it's actually not that easy to pull off. But Paul is telling us you need to say no to self. Matthew 16, Jesus says these words to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. Well, that last little bit there is like, well, that's just a contradiction. How can, I, how can I give my life to save it? And if I, I, I do give my life, how do I get it back? If I lose my life, how do, I, how do I keep it? 
Paul says something similar in Galatians 20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul has so much to say what this looks like. So many of his letters kind of repeat this theme. And I don't want to dive too deeply into this because that's what we're talking about next week. When we get into chapter 2, Paul is talking all about humility, and specifically the humility of Jesus. But I don't want to just simply skip it over either because this is something Jesus says and then years later Paul repeats uh, time and time again. Saying no to self involves self-sacrifice. It involves giving yourself up, giving up what the world wants for you or what you want in the world, and finding what God has for you instead. That's why when we do a baptism, we talk about baptism being a representation of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And maybe you've heard some pastors say this, as they do a baptism and put somebody into the water, they'll say, you're now buried with Christ, you're dying to your old way of life, and then they come up out of the water and you're raised to new life. There's a lot of imagery about this throughout Paul's letters, about dying to, the, to self and coming up a new person in Jesus. And I think what's important about this, and again, we're diving deeper into it next week, is that you have to say no to self in order to be able to say yes to the second thing, which is we say yes to making the gospel priority. You want to make the gospel priority in your life. Sometimes that's easier said than done. But we want to say yes to making the gospel priority. 1 Corinthians 9, Paul says, I do all of this. Everything he's been talking about, I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessing. When you say, how do I make the gospel priority? I think there's something very simple that we do in order to, to, to make this happen. First off, it means that you believe and you understand the gospel. Now, it doesn't mean that you have this entire Bible memorized, that you have every word of it broken down at an expert level so that you've always got an answer for any question somebody asks you. That's not what that means. If you follow Jesus and you read this daily, you're always going to still be discovering something new. You're never going to have this entire Bible figured out. That's not what it means to say that you believe it and you understand it. It means that you capture it, that you understand what Christ did for you, and you run with that. I think another way you could say this too is, is making the gospel priority means that you prioritize it in how you live your life and how you walk with Jesus, in what you do and how you do it. And what Paul says here, what Jesus commanded us to do is it means that you find joy in sharing the word of God with others, with those around you. In fact, that's part of our mission as Christians. If you're if you're a follower, if you've given your life to him, you've been baptized, you've accepted him, you've submitted your life to him, you need to remember that sharing the gospel isn't an option. It's not something you can just do because you want to. It's a command that he gave us. In fact, it was the last command that he gave us before ascending back into heaven. It's a command from our creator to spread his word and make his name famous. But that comes with a challenge. You may say, well, that sounds easy. It, it can be. But it comes with a challenge. Sharing the gospel, you have to understand it's for everybody. You don't just get to pick and choose who you share it with. And, and often when you're sharing it and living that life for Jesus, it means you're going to face hardships along the way. It means you're going to face persecution or trials along the way. Maybe not how you've envisioned. It might not be near as hard or as harsh as you're, you're picturing, but maybe those persecutions are just enough to keep you from doing it. But yet we should do it anyway. Paul goes on in, in verse 18, in the second part of, of chapter 1, he says, I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, but that with full courage now, as always in Christ, I will be honored in my body, whether in life or by death. For me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means faithful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. 
This is a, an interesting little passage here, an interesting part of, of this chapter here, because it in, includes probably the most famous line in Philippians when Paul says, to live is Christ and to die is gain. I think every Christian should probably be able to say that, for me to live is Christ. But you may not fully understand that, especially when it doubles back around and says, well, and to die is gain. Paul is here talking about saying, I'd just as soon die and go be with Jesus. But I know, I know there's a lot more for me to do here first before I do that. And I think when we look at this and we say, how do we do this? How do we live as Christ, as a Christian? If that's what you're telling me to do, what do we do with that? I've got four things I wrote down here that I think, I think Paul would want us to understand as we are trying to learn to live as Christ. The first is this, to live as Christ means we should live in complete union with Jesus or complete unity with Jesus. Think about this uh, as a husband and wife might live in unity or in union, kind of that bond that comes together. In Mark 12, Jesus was explaining to people what it meant to truly love God, and he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. I think he could have summed it up easier and just said, love God with everything that you have. That's, that's how we're challenged to love our spouses, right? In complete union with them. When we do a, a wedding ceremony, we talk about the two becoming one flesh. And so we'll use these kind of object lessons in a wedding. Some people will do a unity candle where they take two candles and light one candle out of the two. Or some people will do sand. That's what Jennifer and I did. We had two colors of sand. We poured them kind of one at a time into this bigger container to make this new design. And that can't be undone. You, you can't undo that, that combining the two become one. That's what we're encouraged to do with Jesus. We become uh, the, the, this play, we get to this place with him where we become in, in complete unity and union with him. That doesn't mean that your life will be perfect. It doesn't mean that you will be perfect. It doesn't mean that one sin in your life disrupts that union or unity with him. It means that you can go to him because he's restored you. It doesn't mean that you're going to be free from your mistakes, but it means that you're now so deeply rooted in God that that can't be broken, that you're with him and that he won't let you go. The second thing to live as Christ means is it means we exalt Jesus in everything that we do. You may not have thought about this, but everything you do is an act of worship. If you're a Christian, you're a follower, everything you do is an act of worship. What kind of worship that is is up to you. Matthew 14, Jesus says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. <clears throat> Let me ask you a question. What about your life shows people who Jesus is? What about the things that you do, the way you walk, the way you talk, everything that you do, what about your life shows people who Jesus is? If you're a follower of him, everything you do reflects towards him. Is that good or bad? Is the sermon that your life is preaching one that's going to win people to Jesus or push them away from Jesus? Again, it's not just about what you say. Often it's about what you do. Colossians 3, Paul says, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Again, maybe you say, I'm not qualified to preach. Uh, I, I don't have a Bible college degree. In fact, I can't name the books of the Bible. You know what? I don't even know if Jesus is in the Old Testament or New Testament. Maybe that's you. That's fine. That's fine. We'll teach you that. But what are you showing other people? What are you showing other people in how you live your life? Often I think about it like this. We let people know what we think about things all the time. Our favorite restaurants, our favorite movies, those types of things. We, we show people and tell people what matters to us. So what are you showing or telling people about Jesus? What are you showing them? Are you showing people through your life, if they know that you're a believer, hey, this Jesus guy is somebody I think I'd like to go get to know? Or are you showing them, you know what? I don't think I want any part of that. I don't think I want any part of that because this person is no different than everybody else I know. You've got to make that a priority. Everything that you do is an act of worship, but you need to let people see what exactly it is you're worshiping and who exactly it is you're worshiping. The third part here, if you want to live as Christ, you die to your selfish desires. 
This is so you can live a selfless and serving and sacrificial life. Again, we hit on this a bit earlier, and we'll hit on it more next week. But I want to look kind of at one specific angle of this first, and that's to die to your selfish desires. That means you live a life that is rooted in love. Love for God, love for others. We said that earlier, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. And the next part, and love your neighbor as yourself. In John 15, Jesus gives a final commandment to his disciples. On his way to the cross, he tells them, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And the very next verse, very next verse, verse 13, he says, greater love has no one than he who had laid on his life for his friends. Jesus is on his way to the cross when he says this. They're headed to Gethsemane, and he knows what's awaiting him when he gets there. And he tells his, his disciples, love each other as I have loved you. And if we go back to what he said earlier, love your neighbor as yourself, there's no boundary to that. We don't pick and choose who it is that we love like Christ loved us. Let me ask you a, qu- a question here. When you became a Christian, what did you expect? What did you expect your life to be like? Just sunshine and roses every day for the rest of your life? Or, or did you expect maybe, you know what, I'm going to be blessed beyond measure now. I'm going to have all the riches that I ever wanted because I'm going to follow God and he's going to do great things for me. There's a dangerous, dangerous angle you can take there. We call it the prosperity gospel or, or the health and wealth theology that if we follow God and do the right things, he's going to bless us with physical or material blessings. We need to be careful with that because, yes, I do believe God will bless you, but not simply because you've done good things, not simply because you've jumped on board and followed him. No, when we follow him, we need to understand something. You're not simply inviting Jesus into your story and into your plan for your life. You're submitting yourself to his. You're submitting your life to his plan, and you're submitting yourself to his will. There's two words we don't often talk about enough when it comes to giving your life to Jesus. That's submit and surrender. Two words that to us Americans are bad words. But when it comes to following Jesus, they're necessary words. And if you want to die to self, that's what it takes. Don't just expect everything to be perfect or all about you. Give your life and serve others. The Son of Man, he says, came not to be served, but to serve. The fourth thing we do, if you want to live as Christ, is you make Jesus your primary focus in life. You may say, well, I think I do this already. And maybe you think that you do, and maybe you want to, and maybe that's your intention to, but I think, again, this one is easier said than done. Matthew 6, Jesus says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Now, in this this section of Matthew 6 in the Sermon on the Mount, he's talking about, about money, specifically from the standpoint of we obsess over it because we worry what's going to happen if we don't have enough. And he says, don't worry about it. Come after me. Seek me and my righteousness and what comes with that, and we'll take care of all of the rest here. When we make him the priority of our lives, what I mean by that is you look at Paul. This is the whole focus of Paul's life. He doesn't care what happens to him in the process. He's in prison, in chains, a slave for Jesus, and yet he is saying, I don't care. My life is still about Jesus, whether that costs me my life or not. When I say make him the priority of your life, what does that mean to you? Does that mean that, yes, you come to church every once in a while? Yes, you've, you've been baptized. Yes, I try to read my Bible as often as I can. Or does that mean every single thing that I do is through him? Every thought that I have is through him. I, I pray that he guides my steps daily, that, that he, he leads me where I need to go, and he's not just somebody that I turn to when it's convenient or easy or I don't have any better plans on the weekend. Let me ask you another question here. What is something about your life you need to change to make that happen? What is it that you obsess over that is the number one priority in your life? Maybe it's something good. Maybe it's your kids. Maybe it's family. Maybe it's a job. I don't know what it is. It's something good that's a good part of your life. What is it that needs to change to be devalued just a little bit so that Jesus can become number one? So that he can become the main focus of everything that you do? Because for a lot of us, That's probably something that we need to think about and focus on. We do these things so that we can live as Christ. Because Paul says if we live as Christ, then to die will be gain. 
Talked about this last week a little bit. It's gonna be a theme we hit on kind of throughout the rest of this series. But for those who live their lives for Jesus, there's something waiting for us after, after that final breath. And for those who don't, there's something waiting for you too. But for those who do, it's heaven. Jesus says in, in John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Again, talking in what seems like a contradiction to our logical minds. You've died. You can't possibly live, right? No, Jesus says you can if you come to me. That I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And that no one comes to the Father except through me. That's what Paul is praying for here. I'd love to get out of this suffering and just go be with Jesus. I've heard this from so many people who get to a point in life where they're just struggling to make it day by day. Maybe it's because they've hit old age. Maybe it's because they're facing something that is just very, very difficult. Or maybe they're just in a bad season of life. I'd just like to go be with Jesus and be simpler. I don't know what the plan is for any of, any of us. You don't know what your plan may be outside of the next few hours. We don't know what the next breath or the next day or the next week or month holds for us. It's important not just to live as Christ, but to live for Christ. Because Jesus has promised us what comes if we do. And that's eternity with him. That's eternity with, with him and the Father. Not eternal separation from him. So let me ask you a question today. We're gonna, gonna start to, to wrap things up here in just a moment. But where's your heart today? Is your heart with him? Are you living for him? Are you living a life for Jesus, with Jesus. I asked you the question earlier, what do you live for? Let me phrase that a little bit differently. Who do you live for? Are you living for him? Or are you living for yourself? If you're living for yourself, I mean, I'd love to have a conversation with you. Maybe it's after service today, you can grab me, you can grab Brad, one of the other staff or elders. You want to put it on your connection card and I'll, I'll talk to you this week. Let me, just let me know. I want to have that conversation with you. Is at some point you have to make that decision. I'm no longer going to live for myself. I'm going to live outside of myself for Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful and grateful for your son. We're grateful, Lord, that he gives us this challenge. We're grateful, Lord, that he calls us to him, that he died on the cross for us. We're so grateful, Lord, that you sent him to be with us. God, I pray right now, if anybody who is facing that decision, Lord, you would speak to their heart and show them, you would show them, Lord, what it means to walk with you and that, that you welcome them, that you want them. God, I pray for those who are and, and maybe just need to get some priorities lined up correctly so we can live as Christ. God, show them what needs to change. Challenge us, Lord, that we would help each other, that we would be iron sharpening iron so that we could get closer to you as a collective group so thankful, Lord, for Jesus, for the life he calls us to live. We're grateful, Lord, for the challenge that comes with that, but we're grateful for the reward that waits us when we do. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to step into our time of communion. If you didn't grab it earlier, the, the black tables around the room have the communion packets in it. There's a little piece of bread on the top, a cup of juice in the bottom. It represents the body and the blood of Jesus. And as we, we come to this, I was thinking this week, I always like it when it snows because I can look out my backyard and it just looks pristine. My backyard is a mess. <laughs> it's, it's torn up from the kids and the dog and, and there's toys and random stuff everywhere, whether that's Titus or my dog that's dragged it out, I don't know. Stuff all over the place. But when it snows, that's all you see. The Bible says that Jesus' blood washes us white as snow that his blood washes away our sin. It takes it away from us and it removes us from our sin as far as the east is from the west. Communion is our time where we remember what Jesus did on the cross for us so that we could be washed white as snow. So as we take this bread and this, this juice this morning, we reflect back on what he did for us and we look forward, the promise that he has for us, the promise of heaven, what he'll do for us again one day. Father, we're so grateful for the body and blood of Jesus. We're so grateful, Lord, for the promise of, of salvation, of restoration with you, of being made whole again, brought back to the way you created us. God, I pray today across our room as we take this that we would honor you in what we do. 
you would bless us as we do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Well, um, this little puppy has a lot of information on it, so I encourage you guys to look at it. Besides that, as you leave, you can just grab a handful, tuck them in your coat, keep it nice and warm. You guys are asleep. <laughs> that was funny. Okay, we got several things that we want to push. Uh, uh, even though the weather's bad, there's still things going on. And number one is small groups. Uh, this is not really the last day, but it's the last day that we're talking about it specifically for small group signups. We really want to encourage you guys to go to the website, look at the options that are available there, and then sign up to be a part of one of those groups. Um, lots of spaces available. A couple of uh, overloaded, but uh, most of them are still available. So make sure you do that today if you can, because starting this week, most of them are going to begin. And so if you can get in early, that would be great. Um, the next thing is going to be uh, today, if you have signed up to to eat lunch with Meet the Pastors at uh, 12 o'clock or so, 12.30. Um, we're going to do that today. And then closer look next week for anybody that's interested in knowing more about the church, uh, about the function, about the mi ministry philosophy, about the history, things like that. Um, that could be for you if you're interested in being a member of the church or if you're just interested in knowing more about what our background is and what we believe. Um, that would be a really good class for you to sign up for as well. That's going to be next Saturday, so make sure you sign up for that. And the next one, I believe, is uh, Super Start. This is a, a fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, fourth and fifth grade, and sixth grade. Fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. I'm getting my cues from Stefan over there. This fourth through sixth grade, um, it's in Nebraska, and it's a, a very high-energy overnight weekend uh, through CIY, which is a very good organization as far as uh, promoting uh, 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 a life change and also ministry and things like that. Uh, it's a really good program. So if you have anybody in that age group, uh, whether it's your own child or a, a grandchild or somebody you know, uh, make sure you have them check that out and get signed up for that. Um, I don't have it with me. When is that deadline? It's end of the month, isn't it? End of the month is a deadline for registering for that. So you got a couple more weeks on that. So make sure you do it. Um, and the second to the last thing is going to be... Um, our uh, Weekend to Remember is a conference that's coming up. It's a marriage conference, and our marriage ministry team's pushing that. Um, and there's information in the bulletin. We'll have more information on the website, um, and then we'll eventually have a registration table as well. But we just wanted to make sure we mentioned that so you could look at it. It's in Overland Park, and it's uh, it's an overnight thing as well. I think two nights, actually. And so you, lots of lodging options, so you can stay at the hotel or you could just commute if you want to, whatever you want to do. So make sure you check that out.
I think that's it. So let's uh, pray and then we'll be dismissed. And I hope that you guys have a nice, warm, cozy, safe uh, day today. God, we love you so much. We thank you for the love that you give us every day and the kindness you show through your son, Jesus, and the desire that you have for us to be better and to grow and to be become more like you. And I pray that you will help us to have that same desire, following the love that you have and the example that you have given us. Help us to become uh, your servants and uh, be obedient in the things that you wish us to do. Help us to do that for us, but also in that, we know that that will actually help others as well. So help us to, to be an encouragement to others around us. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys have a great weekend.